8.1 Questions to Siri 1. Are you human, Siri? Close enough, I'd say. 2. What are you doing after work? What am I doing? I'm talking with you. 3. Where have I put my keys? They'll probably be in the second to last place you look. 4. When will pigs fly, Siri? When they figure out how to buy tickets. 5. When is the world going to end? As long as you keep me charged, we should be just fine. 8.2 Alpha Go, a breakthrough for artificial intelligence. Why was it so important when the computer program Alpha Go beat a human at the Chinese game of Go in 2016? A computer had beaten a world chess champion 20 years before. So what was new? Well, Go is more difficult and demanding than chess. And the computers that used chess programs could only do what humans had programmed them to do. AlphaGo was a new kind of program which learns by itself. It learned 150,000 human games of Go and then played against itself over a million times each day. It quickly learned from its mistakes. And developed a style of play that was so individual it shocked even its creators. Real artificial intelligence had truly arrived, along with all the hopes and fears of what it might mean for our future. 8.3 Experts give their views on artificial intelligence. Lee s e d o l Professional Go player. Robots will never understand the beauty of the game the same way that we humans do. After his defeat, Lee said that he hadn't expected AlphaGo to play the game so perfectly. Demis Hassabis, creator of AlphaGo. It's very exciting to start imagining what it might be able to tackle next. Hasabis thinks AI is still decades away from human level intelligence, but could soon help solve problems such as climate change and cancer. Nick Bostrom, philosopher. Machine intelligence may be the last invention that humanity will ever need to make. Bostrom says that the machines will then be better at inventing than we are. But he warns us that we must make sure they follow our preferences, not their own. Stephen Hawking, cosmologist. Success in creating AI would be the biggest event in human history. Unfortunately, it might also be the last. Hawking worries that the development of artificial super intelligence could be the end of the human race. Nigel Shadbolt, AI professor. The danger is not artificial intelligence, it's natural stupidity. Shadbolt agrees that AI machines might do things we don't expect. But says they're not going to take control unless we're stupid enough to invite them to. Kim Simmons, AI consultant. AI can help us to focus on what humans are uniquely good at. AI may mean that more jobs are done by machines, but Simmons says they won't be able to compete with us in creativity and human to human skills. 8.4 Discussing Grammar 1. Are you driving to France next week? We're not sure. We might fly this time. 2. Aren't you going to take a jacket? No, I'm not. The forecast said it's going to be very warm today. 3. 
fancy going to the cinema this evening? Sorry, I'm working late tonight. How about tomorrow night? I'll call you. Four. What are you doing Saturday night? I'm not sure yet. I may go round to a friend's house to watch the football, or he may come round to mine. Five. Are you not going to have any wine? No, I'm driving everyone home. Six. Are you still having problems with your neighbours? Yes, they've been getting worse. We're going to try and move. Seven. Oh no! Three nil down at half time. Come on, you never know. I think we could still win. Eight. You're out every night. You won't pass those exams next month, you know. I know. I'll work harder nearer the time. I promise. Eight point five. Is a robot going to take my job? One, Jessica. Some news stories are already written automatically. Sports and business ones, where it's mostly the numbers and names that change. That'll happen more, but I don't think machines will ever replace really good journalists. And I'm going to take time off and write a novel next year. Now, a machine writing a truly great novel about what it is to be human—that's not going to happen. Two, Rob. It's obvious machine intelligence is going to take over a lot of the work junior lawyers have done in the past, but I'm fine with that. I'll be happy for a machine to do all the boring research into past cases. A brilliant lawyer has to know how to play on human emotions in court, and a robot won't be able to do that. Three, Derek. Well, they say these driverless cars could take over the roads, so my job's not safe. But there's going to be accidents for sure, and then there'll be big problems. I mean, like who'll be to blame? The car? The bloke that programmed it, and I'll tell you what we should do: replace them politicians with intelligent robots. They might have some better ideas, and tell the truth. Four, Hillary. There are some restaurants now that are run by robots. People may go for it because it's new and different. So yes, my job is at risk, but they'll soon miss the human contact. And really, it depends on us to make the most of that. I mean, a slow, rude, unhelpful waiter or a robot—which are you going to choose? But a warm, friendly, funny waiter or a robot—the human's going to win every time. Eight point six. One. I think my job will be safe. No robot could do it. Yeah, I don't think you'll have a problem. Two. I don't think you'll like that film. It's a bit too violent. I won't go and see it then. I hate violence. Three. I think you and Joe will get on well. You have a lot in common. Yes, I think we could become good friends. Four. I don't think we'll eat here again. The food wasn't great. Yes, I'm certainly not going to leave a tip. Eight point seven. One. It's not going to rain. There isn't a cloud in the sky. Two. You're not going to die. You've only got a cold. Three. Liverpool are going to win. It's four nil with ten minutes left. Four. She's going to get a divorce. She's already been to a lawyer. Eight point eight. A brighter future. This week on Brighter Futures, we're asking the big question: How can we keep the lights on? 
Where is our energy going to come from if we have to stop using fossil fuels? Our guest is Nicole Clark, a professor in energy technology. Nicole, can we really make big cuts in the amount of fossil fuels we use? We'll have to if we're serious about keeping the rise in global temperatures to below 2 degrees. But we don't have to be gloomy about it. We should start getting excited about other energy options because the possibilities are exciting. OK, let's look at them then. Wind power. People have strong feelings about that, don't they? Mm, yes. Some people are pretty negative about wind farms, saying they spoil the countryside. How do you feel about them? Uh, I like seeing one or two wind turbines. They can be quite beautiful. But when there are a lot of them together, I don't know, there is something a bit almost scary about them. Mm. Getting them offshore is the best solution. The UK now has the world's largest offshore wind farm, you know. It's in the Thames Estuary, east of London. Wow, I didn't know that. Yes. Denmark is the leader, though. 40% of its electricity comes from wind, and they're going to try and get to 80% by 2035. What about solar power? Who's the leader there? At the moment, it's Germany. Really? Yes, which shows you don't need to be a very sunny country to make use of it. On some summer days, 50% of Germany's electricity comes from solar power. But solar panels can look ugly on buildings, can't they? Hmm. But they are getting much thinner, so you don't really notice them. And they can even be a part of the windows of a building. It's an amazing fact that just one hour of the solar energy that lands on Earth is enough to power the whole world for a year. So we really do need to make more use of it. And it's obviously great for sunny countries. It's in those countries that you get the big solar parks that focus the sun's rays to heat water and produce electricity. The Avampa plant in America's Mojave Desert is the biggest. It uses 347,000 mirrors, over a third of a million. It's incredible. Yes, I've seen it. It looks like something from science fiction. It's amazing. <laughs> But the real dream solution is fusion energy, and that's a real possibility. Uh, fusion energy is nuclear energy, yes? Yes, but it's not like the nuclear energy we use now. It's clean, and it uses hydrogen, which you can make from seawater, so we'll never run out of it. The problem is you need to do it at temperatures of over 100 million degrees Celsius. Mm, that sounds like a big challenge. Yes, but it's been done. Only for a minute or two, though, and very expensively. People think fusion energy could be a major source of electricity in 30 to 40 years. But I'm pretty sure we could do it a lot sooner with more research. We haven't spent nearly enough on research into new forms of energy because we thought we could keep going with coal, oil and gas. But that's all going to change now. 8.9 Spoken English. It's pretty good. 1. Did your team win? No, but they played pretty well, so they only lost 1-0. 2. You haven't lost your passport, have you? No, I'm pretty sure it's in my bag somewhere. 3. Do you like skiing? Yes, I do, but I'm pretty hopeless at it. 4. What do you think of my English? I think it's pretty good. 8.10 Prefixes and suffixes 1. I'm going to stay awake for two weeks. That's impossible. 2. Is the past tense of sleep Sleeped. No, it's slept. It's irregular. 3. Why can't you buy and sell chewing gum in Singapore? Because it's illegal. 4. Quick, quick! Bring me my coffee now! Don't be so impatient. 5. What happened to my document? 
It was there on the screen and it's gone. Has it just disappeared? 6. I can never write accommodation correctly. Yes, it's easy to misspell. 7. The electricity went off exactly as the football match was about to begin. That was unlucky. 8. Do we have to get dressed up for the welcome party? No, it's informal, so wear what you like. 8.11 Changing word stress. 1. The doctors are going to operate on my grandma's knee. Oh dear. I hope the operation goes well. 2. That's an amazing photograph, isn't it? Yes. It's by Matt Hennick. He's one of my favourite photographers. 3. Do you think it would be preferable to phone people rather than email them? Yes, I'm sure everyone would prefer that. 4. Did you explain the homework to Maria? I did, but I don't think she understood my explanation. 8.12. Arranging to meet. Kevin, it's me, Jeff. Jeff, long time no see. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Listen, I'm up in town later this week for a conference and I might stay on till Sunday morning. I was wondering if we could meet. Oh, I'd love to. But this weekend of all weekends, I'm incredibly busy. Come on, Kev. You must have some free time. <laughs> Hang on. Let me check my diary. Um... OK, go for it. Right. What are you doing Friday evening? Um, let me see. Uh, sorry, I can't do Friday evening. It's my tango class. I really don't want to miss it, because, well, there's this girl in the class that I'm really interested in. Oh, say no more. <laughs> so I could meet you late afternoon before the class? Uh, no, that won't work. The conference doesn't finish till 6.30 on the Friday. Um, have you got any free time on Saturday morning? Um, no. I'm having my hair cut at 10 o'clock and then I'm meeting my sister. She's going to show me the flat she's thinking of renting and we're having lunch after that. I'm free most of the afternoon, though. That's no good, I'm afraid. I've arranged to meet some people from the conference. They could be useful contacts. So, how about Saturday evening? Does that work for you? Or are you doing something then? Yeah, sorry, the evening's out for me. I'm going to the theatre with some friends. It's been booked for ages. But, I have an idea. What time are you leaving on Sunday? Late morning. I'm getting the train at 11.55. Well, then why don't we meet at the station? Yeah, that's a great idea. We could have a coffee there. I've got a better idea. There's a cafe next to the station that does a really good full English breakfast. Let's meet there and have breakfast. Shall we say half nine? Oh, can we make it ten o'clock? <laughs> it is Sunday, you know. <laughs> Fine. Ten it is. And I hope the conference goes well. Thanks, Kev. See you Sunday. 8.13 Pronunciation 1. I was wondering if we could meet. 2. What are you doing Friday evening? 3. So I could meet you late afternoon before the class. 4. I'm free most of the afternoon, though. 5. So, how about Saturday evening? Does that work for you? 6. Then why don't we meet at the station? 7. Let's meet there and have breakfast. Shall we say half nine? 
eight. Can we make it ten o'clock? Eight point fourteen. Writing for talking two. My cause for concern. The thing I'm concerned about at the moment is the influence that video games may have on children. Let me explain why. I've been reading lots of newspaper articles on the subject, and I also have a personal interest. You see, I have a younger brother, Craig. He's thirteen years old, and I'm afraid he's becoming a video game addict. Just a few years ago, Craig had many interests. He played football. He was learning judo. He went out on his bike with his friends. He was a happy, fun-loving boy. Now, he spends hours every day in front of a screen in a virtual world, playing virtual games, usually violent ones. And he becomes really angry if our parents tell him to stop. Research shows that children between the ages of two and five regularly play video games, and that by the age of eight, they spend an average of twenty-five minutes on them. It's much easier to find ways to play video games than it used to be because of tablets and smartphones. This is not a problem for most children. However, by their early teens, a small minority have become addicts. Playing for at least thirty hours a week, Dr. Mark Griffiths of Nottingham Trent University, an expert in video game addiction, finds this figure worrying. He says that children may become so addicted that they stop doing homework, start playing truant, and even steal money in order to buy the games. It's likely that this addiction will only get worse with the coming of virtual reality headsets, which make the experience of getting completely lost in a virtual world even more powerful. I have two more concerns. Firstly, I worry that the violence in the games could cause children to become more violent. My brother isn't violent, but he is certainly bad-tempered if he is stopped from playing. Secondly. I worry that sitting without exercise for so long is bad for your health. Craig often plays five hours a day, and some days his thumbs are really painful, and he can't sleep because he is overexcited. His schoolwork is going from bad to worse. Finally, Dr. Griffith says that more research is needed, but I don't need to read more research to conclude that video games cause problems. He should come and meet my brother. That's all the evidence he needs.